brief about MWB a bit. So Manager Without Order is a noble initiative by three young, highly enthusiastic professionals. And the foremost goal of this institution was to bridge the gap between various stakeholders for the national uh, building and by connecting the network of professionals along with uh, management uh, within the management schools. So uh, this is all about us. And without further delay, uh, I would like to introduce the guest of the evening, Mr. Uh, Manish Kothari. So, uh, sir, welcome. First of all, thanks a lot Thank for you. finding out time for us. And uh, as you can see, the... Any Hello. customers are using this textbook, if you pick up, you will see thousands of examples where it says that, Hello. you know. I'm so sorry, please mute uh, whomsoever is on call. Yes, Prachi, please go ahead. Okay. Uh, yes, sorry, sir, for the inconvenience. And I'm so sorry my video is not uh, there because there is some network issue from my end as well. So, yes. So, uh, the guest of the evening, Mr. Manish Kothari, has 29 plus years of experience in foundry and industry management experience. So, uh, he is a gem who is working in several departments. So, he is working for the Rural Livelihood and Women Empowerment under social organizations. Currently, uh, if we talk about few of his positions, so he's the man managing director of Rhino Machines at Foundry Technology. He's the industry partner at Mimansa, Women's Ethnic Wear, and he's the business advisor at MSA Bioenergy. Sir has a, a 360 approach to everything in life, and that is the reason why we're working for as well as business management social entrepreneurship, and uh, he's uh, devoting his time for vocational education training as well. So uh, we are blessed to have you here, sir, and the stage is all yours now. Thank you. Sir? Hello. Prachi, just message her to join again. Everyone else, please keep yourself in mute. Mm -hmm. Yes, sir. The stage is all yours. Yeah. Uh, thank you very much. Uh, it's uh, uh, something which has happened very fast. I think it was three, four days, three, four days back. Uh, uh, Sayaji, I think we are getting a bounce back. Some noise from your mic. So I, I actually had a post on the LinkedIn and uh, Manish uh, Agarwal contacted me and then connected me with Rakesh. Oh, wow. uh, and uh, here we are having a discussion on uh, how to make talking about ways to well. I'm happy to be with all of you. Uh, so you have given a, a brief introduction already about me, but basically, uh, uh, I, hello. Yes, sir. We can hear you. Yeah, Manish, yeah, we can yeah. hear you. Yeah, yeah. Uh, you may oh. like to mute others. <laughs> we can unmute and talk. I can't mute. I can't mute mute somebody. But so let me let me start with. Uh, uh, so I just put my screen on uh, presentation. So it's about exploring uh, the ways to wealth and 
uh, how how waste to wealth can be made sustainable uh, so we have been seeing for uh, uh, at least i have been seeing for several years uh, that lot of things uh, uh, have been happening in our country around the world there is a lot of discussion going around about sustainability we had this sustainability uh, development goals uh, cop 20 cop 22 as we had discussed and uh, there has been a lot of buzz and uh, concern about uh, resource efficiency uh, concern about how much we are consuming and uh, in one of the panel discussions where i was involved i was listening to one of the speakers and uh, when he gave me the figure that uh, the average uh, efficiency of any uh, resource today uh, material resource which they are consuming is only 22% so this is a research uh, which was done maybe 22 23% is the overall resource efficiency that we are having today and this was about i think a couple of years back uh, though i have been working on this area for quite some time now but i started to realize uh, this this uh, gap between uh, the resource available and what we are doing is very huge and that gap is what i started to understand as being a waste so i tried to caption this statement into two parts break it up into two parts so waste for me is uh, again linked to that statement of resource utilization and trying to understand its true potential so whether it's from physical or from uh, time uh, with physical can be as a material as time there are so many uh, or the efficiency of people working is also a waste Uh, if we have, we say that in our country we have a tremendous uh, possibility of youth and uh, uh, people who are ready to work very hard available, but unfortunately we are not able to utilize their time to that potential, and uh, that is why probably our efficiencies are not high. Uh, even that I would consider as a waste. So waste is not only about material; it's also about the time. and uh, this is something which always has been part of uh, the mission at uh, my organization so i am a second generation entrepreneur the business was started by my father from where in uh, 8384 as a project engineering and one of the key key strengths or usps of project engineering was again related to material handling and how to minimize the waste of movement so what we talk about waste in 5s and uh, all the modern techniques which we have identifying the seven waste is something which uh, was already part of our basic ecosystem of uh, engineering projects and the concept of understanding waste uh, whether it is material movement so in a foundry where i was associated the foundry industry to make 1 kg of casting how many times the material is moving up and down how many times it is going from here or there is something which was uh, which still today is a challenge and there's a lot of waste which has been documented uh, a value stream mapping has been done so overall the understanding of waste comes from different perspectives and that's what i would like to share with you from whatever i have heard and how we can convert this into wealth which can be related to environment uh, the climate changes which we have uh, poverty uh, because we don't have equal opportunities we don't have uh, gender balance issues livelihood issues and uh, again resource efficiency uh, is Uh, having responsible consumption so all the sustainability goals the 17 goals which cop 22 would be something when we start working they are, they are all converting into wealth so there are two two projects which i would like to share with you uh, during this uh, interaction and uh, so and both these projects are connected some somewhere to this concept of circular economy 
Now, this is something which is there on the website, CEO Guide to Circular Economy. Uh, I was exposed to this concept, though I knew about this, but uh, uh, in-depth exposure came when I was part of a session uh, at Nido uh, had conducted this session with, along with the Ministry of MSME in June uh, 2018. And there, when they started explaining about the circular economy and how we can uh, create responsible production, this entire circle explains that circular economy and uh, the, the guiding light to uh, all the innovations which are coming up today. It's all about resource efficiency, whether it is from the digital perspective, biological, physical, uh, it can be a resource recovery, it can be as a service, so, so the way we are progressing IT, uh, the way we are progressing with IoT, and how, uh, so if I, if I take a simple example of an ag agri produce going back into agriculture, is when the circle becomes complete. Uh, so this has been something which a lot of people have been working, but somehow it has not been grown to that extent. So let us try to explore a couple of possibilities on, uh, particularly on the resource uh, recovery. Uh, I would be talking about that. Uh, extending the life, the life cycle of a product. So this is this is one of the projects uh, which was covered. So may I request to uh, mute the mic? Uh, I don't know whose mic is there. Hello. Yeah. Thank you. So this is this is one of the projects uh, which uh, recently has. Uh, been covered by some international uh, websites and uh, recently by the Better India, and that's how we got connected. Because once the innovation gets into the social media, and social media is a very powerful tool, it is again improving our resource efficiency. So I don't have to go to a seminar or go to a presentation, travel. So today, this also reflects one of the resource efficiency, which uh, is helping us connect with each other, and. Uh, this uh, uh, entire uh, project is about two different ways uh, which are there. If you see on the right side, one is, uh, so I'll go into the detail in the next slide, but it is covering different aspects. And uh, I started calculating the impact of this project. So it is talking about, they're talking about two SDGs over here. One is SDG 8 which is about decent uh, work and economic growth, and SDG 12, which is about responsible consumption and production. So both are connected to, uh, so there is a uh, people who are available or is, as a resource uh, who, who could get gainful employment by converting a material which has been considered as waste into a usable material. So there are two wealths which you are converting. One is converting what you are throwing away uh, which is around, uh, so what I have estimated for India from the, on the basis of the production of uh, foundry. So the origin of this entire exercise is starting from foundry. For those who may not understand foundry, uh, I would, uh, in layman terms, it is, uh, so this is what the Better India Lady was trying to understand from me. He said, sir, Foundry is something which everybody will not understand. So I explained to her that uh, cooking is something everybody understands. Yes, sir. So she had said yes. So I said, when you uh, bake a cake, you have to pour the batter into a, first you have to make a batter, batter. you have to melt the butter and uh, mix all the ingredients and make a batter. So that is equivalent to metal. And you have to pour it inside a vessel, which is the mold. So when you mold, uh, when you cast the liquid batter into a specific shape, or you cast liquid metal into a specific shape, it is called a casting. Uh, and casting is produced, the, the industry which produces casting is called a foundry. So that's, uh, that's the way I can explain to you in 
something which you can relate to if you are not coming from the engineering or industry background and this industry the mold was produced from sand uh, major majority of the foundries 70% of the foundries use sand uh, silica sand which is mined from rivers of allahabad or beaches uh, and uh, mixed with bentonite again which is mined from uh, clay clay resources in kutch and other places and mix together with water to make a mold then when the mold is when you finish pouring of the metal you are breaking that mold and whatever uh, sand you have uh, made it is recycled but during recycling there is a 3 to 5% loss or compensation which has to happen uh, continuous uh, as a continuous process which generates this waste which i have shown around 12.85 million tons of waste uh, considering only 30% of the foundry convert to this uh, process uh, and are able to convert so this is the amount of waste which is there every year and uh, this is a problem statement which came to us uh, from one of the foundry owners that can we have a solution for uh, addressing the waste problem which is there in our industry so starting from a small scale and uh, over a period of one and a half two years uh, we have our r&d team so one of my key r&d persons rajikant and we uh, kept on experimenting together with this material there were two couple of young uh, graduate students who came us to the same they worked on the floor made some trials and after a lot of trials we found that if we use 20% to 25% of waste plastic along with this dust we can bond and we are able to form big paper blocks or any shape of die which we have and this uh, screen summarizes the impact which it can create so we can get into details it can we are talking of revenue we are talking of return of investment and uh, so on one side is the input and other side is the output <clears throat> this involved uh, now to make this a business model so now we have identified the uh, waste we have identified where it can be used we have identified uh, what could be the impact possible impacts how to go about doing it so when we are uh, discussing about innovation uh, as a ecosystem we are discussing about how you can make an innovation sustainable Uh, one of the important factors which i got exposed to during my innovation accelerator program in 2015 was to clearly identify the key resources which are involved clearly identify the customer segment understand the value proposition and what are the resources which are needed who are the key players who are the actors in this entire exercise so after having identified uh, what could be the uh, possible outcome uh, uh, so there was a lot of iteration i divided this into five segments so on the left side was uh, two activities which is from the supply side <laughs> on the supply side uh, which is about waste plastic collection and sand dust and waste so which could have uh, connections with rag pickers industry municipal corporation society community and which is 20% 25% of the material and foundry industry is uh, my key resource as of now but uh, after this article we have been receiving a lot of uh, inquiries from other industry also can we use this waste can we use this waste so we said we'll we we'll look at experimenting and doing trials in our factory and maybe in the next month we'll have some other materials also as the input material and in the center lies the the uh, actual innovation where the one highlighted in green is where the processing happens and this is the key product innovation which happened at rhino uh, and still it's an ongoing activity where we continuously improve that product Uh, so uh, uh, plastic crushing mixing and handling system extrusion uh, with the pollution control wet scrubber and water reprocessing plant and a block making machine uh, to make this innovation 
uh, again sustainable uh, this is sorry to pardon? interject uh, yeah sorry to interject what is a screw here like screw and material handling supplier uh, just so, so it is it is something yeah. yeah so i i'll show you in the next slide maybe but uh, basically it's all about material handling so oh, how okay. to feed the material into the system so there's a processing plant where you have a material handling system there's a process machine there's a pollution okay. control machine and there's a block making machine okay so so and of course the plastic uh, processing so, yeah otherwise all made sense only the screw thing was not fitting in place so if you yeah, yeah. explain so, okay. so screw is just it's just one of the mechanical devices it can be belt conveyor it can be a screw conveyor it's just oh, conveyor okay. oh okay, okay. conveying okay. element okay uh, you can ask me questions anytime you want no, no problems uh, so the processing plant was on one side the input on one side and on the output side we have to look about talk about the production and distribution uh one of the very important aspects which i started to understand when you are talking of waste to wealth again i'll i'll keep on going back to this subject because that's where our core topic lies it's not about this innovation but it's about how we can make a waste to waste to wealth uh, ecosystem sustainable the challenge is lie when whenever there is an input material which is coming at zero cost uh, and the moment i look at uh, it as a commercial entity uh, then the the risk factors of that entire exercise may go up because i am exposed to a material which i have no control on uh, if i take it as a commercial project uh, and this has happened across lot of waste to wealth projects uh, in the so many decades i have seen one of them i'll show you later on so i understood that uh, it has to be a balance of social and economic structure uh, i have been working with lot of uh, as initially prakya explained that i have been working with a lot of social ngos and uh, very dedicated people so one of the solutions which i think could work well is if this solution is run by somebody who is already into the social ecosystem because this is a social project it is not a, a commercial production project it's not mining something or taking some material and doing some validation we are collecting waste from the society which is a social responsibility and a group of social entrepreneurs who take this uh, production and uh, so probably a self help group or an ngo or a group of social entrepreneurs who could take this uh, uh, project into uh, manage the production so they would have get access to waste from the so there can be a multi party agreement with uh, the local municipal bodies of the industry and a long term contract on the supply chain uh, a four year three year or five year contract uh, they would get the support of administration and management from uh, either they have their own group or can get external and of course employ skilled and semi skilled and skilled people in the morning actually i was having a discussion with one of my colleagues uh, in anand and we were discussing could we take this group of people rack pickers who are picking up the uh, the, the plastic and put them in this place as a and give them employment so this is something which a self help group could look at connecting the dots from and making this uh, uh, so when you are looking at sdg about poverty this is where this project could fit in and a production activity handled by a balance of professionals and uh, social groups is something which i think would uh, be more sustainable on long term and the distribution uh, activity again those who are giving the waste probably if they become the consumers then this distribution circle becomes much easier so we get into a responsible cycle of uh, i buy some material i have used only 30% of its capability so again we are talking of resource there was a resource called plastic i used it once but it could be used number of times 
So what I'm saying is, whatever I've used once, I'm giving it to a system which will process and give it back to me so I can use it again and improve the resource, or natural resource productivity. So one is to have this cycle in which, again, municipal corporations or, or the social organizations can be an important player. This, this screen probably is core to most of the social uh, waste to wealth projects uh, if we are able to structure them in this uh, manner from my experience. There can be different perspectives, but this is what I could understand. Uh, this is uh, just to give you a schematic of how this uh, project works. So you have the... Uh, so in the input, we have the waste. We have the plastic collection coming from here. The plastic is shredded. There's a prepayment. You mix the two material in a ratio of 80, 20, 25, 75, depending on the plastic. This is where you process the, the mixture. Again, weight, it goes into a molding machine and there you get a product, which is the end use. So on the left side, we have the input, the processing and the well. So this, this is a, a brief, uh, I would say an outline of that entire project uh, graphically, where here we are employing people to process, we are employing people to collect, we are employing people to distribute. So people are there involved everywhere, where the same material, both the materials, which were being used only once, for example, uh, the single use plastic, which cannot be recycled they are getting a second life. And, and we are improving the resource efficiency uh, of the same material, uh, which is converting the waste into wealth. Uh, I've also tried to calculate some figures, which probably may not, uh, uh, you may not be able to relate so easily, but just to give you the how the, so if I spread this entire uh, uh, waste to wealth story over five years, then probably this is the amount of employment which I can generate. This is the revenue which I can generate from waste. So consider that it was a zero value and also it also having a negative value because it was harming our environment. So instead of harming the environment, we are talking of creating money from that material. And uh, from the revenue, there's also a net profit because we are selling the product. And, and we are creating a business cycle where the money is going into employment and it is self-sustained. Uh, again, not funded. Maybe the initial funding of the capital can be through CSR, but the, the operating cost, the OPEX as we call it, is... Uh, Oh, the operating cost is self-supported. And on the other side, this is the quantum of uh, material which we could look at once we scale up and stabilize this uh, uh, process. We can look at, this is the quantity of waste which we can look at addressing. This is coming from uh, looking at responsible consumption and production. So two key SDGs getting addressed, 8 and 12. There are some other SDGs which will get addressed is uh, these blocks do not use water for processing. So there'll be an impact on that. We'll, there'll be uh, an impact on consumption of uh, natural resources like cement and sand in case of paper block or uh, the soil in case of red bricks. Uh, so, and even if you're replacing fly ash bricks, we may be consuming one waste, but we still are consuming cement and water over there. So these are the possible impacts which uh, have been calculated. Two and, questions, Manishi. Yes. Yeah. Uh, one is uh, the commercial viability as against competing uh, brick blocks versus this newly innovated blocks. How do right. they compare? 
that's question one question two is about the market size or uh, the size you, you have projected is it for like whole of india is considered or so only this, one state or, yeah okay. so the first so let me answer the second question first this is only about india number one. and india is 10% so and it is all based on the foundry industry uh, the base is not on plastic the base is on based on the foundry industry in okay. india so, so india is covering 10 to 12 million tons of cast every year and how many clusters a major cluster spread across Let's india maybe around 15 15, 15 clusters 15 clusters india. okay okay 15 to 20 clusters across india uh, but okay. but if you see uh, the small even a small cluster like anand where we are we have sufficient mm -hmm. bricks to produce uh, thousand bricks per day yeah and anand can consume uh, thousand bricks per day also or you yeah. need to convey these to some other place so if we see construction activities that are going on the number of bricks required are much more than what is produced today. Uh, what inquiry is that? Can you supply us eighty thousand bricks? Eighty thousand bricks. I need five months. <laughs> okay, perfect. Okay. okay. So the, the, there is a lot of uh, so there were two two areas so two places where this article was published. Uh, to, because your answer is very uh, question is very interesting. One is on an architectural website uh, where architectures were. Uh, so our architecture uh, architect partner, uh, Sridhar Rao and his company are R&D Labs. What they did was they published, uh, they put a press release into international websites in the US, Europe, and it went into the architectural magazines. And there was a lot of interest because of this new material. Uh, most today there's a lot of uh, uh, awareness about uh, sustainability and yes, yes. sustainable products yeah. across the world maybe maybe in india it is catching up because i, I got some calls from indian uh, large architect houses i have had con calls with them and they are very interested uh, and they are asking when are you going to scale this up and i had a call from a large corporate today i would not be able to give the name but they they said that this is something which is they would like to support also. Uh, it was not only about uh, buying the bricks. They said we would be happy to see this innovation can go to different level. Uh, we have been approached by some one, one or two of the government departments. Uh, how can this be uh, scaled up and can we do more uh, validation of this? Because we have done a entry level validation. Yeah. Right? With the resources available with us as an SME, uh, we have done an entry level validation. There's a lot of validation. There's a lot of uh, yeah, like uh, whether it's toxic or not, or uh, is there any other yeah. kind of health yeah. risk? Is there or not those things tested or not? I was to ask. So those, so all those all those tests will be done over a period of time. Uh, but okay, at this moment we are dumping. Uh, I have seen sites where pits are being filled with plastic. Yeah, I have myself. Yeah, yeah. So definitely, yeah, this is better than what. Especially single-use plastic. Especially yeah, single-use yeah. plastic. Yeah, it's amazing. Yeah. So, so coming back to your first question about uh, comparative. Uh, sixty percent of the processing costs, fifty to sixty percent, is uh, in uh, electrical energy as of today. So. Where, when we are conceptualizing this project, we are talking of uh, using solar energy, which makes this a uh, almost like a zero energy cost input. Uh, so if I take this brick today is around four to five rupees per brick. Okay. Uh, whereas if you take this brick in a metro is around 12 to 40 rupees. Oh. If you take in a small town like Anand, it is five rupees, a red brick. But when you talk of a quality brick, because this brick has the strength of this brick is two yeah. times even. I've seen that video. Less. Yes. <laughs> uh, same same uh, brick, right? You were throwing it on brick, the floor. And, yeah. So that brick is lighter by 40% and stronger two times. Uh, and that that probably architects can understand much better how, how much it should be useful. Uh, there's a plan to uh, use them in partition walls 
which uh, where your fire uh, uh, safety levels are lower than the load bearing walls so that those okay. tests will also happen over a period of time in the next coming 2 3 months uh but as far as use in the boundary walls is concerned it can be used the second part again uh, when we are talking of innovation and making any innovation sustainable uh innovation calls for thinking out of the box now most of the times we are only thinking of brick as a brick right what if i make this shape entirely different and make it like a lego assembly game uh okay so, so I, what i do is i eliminate the entire uh, we are able to eliminate the entire cement mortar for bonding it and this is another so this is the second improvement with uh, project which has been taken on hand by us so we have produced the regular brick we have made it hollow uh, we have got the uh, results so the next uh, your first question is very pertinent that how can we could we make this project where even if the investment is not coming from csr could this project stand on its own feet then the only risk remaining would be the input material cost which is at the moment zero uh, at the moment yeah. people are paying for disposal yes. but maybe when they find that this can this is having a value yeah. we yeah. may start getting charge for that Sure. so having that cushion is also important or yes. having having a uh, mandate from the ecosystem society community or the municipal body is also very important to ensure that we don't lose focus on resource efficiency our our intention should not get diverted uh, if the intention goes into making money out of this waste then probably we might lose the uh, entire story so okay. this is this is something which uh, i put together as a so in the center you see the plant on the left side you see uh, corporate social responsibility municipal so corporate social responsibility can also be a community responsibility uh, i have seen a uh, fantastic work done through uh, uh, community and crowd funding also to support such a system because we are all concerned about our environment And, and this this webinar also has come out of a concern about environment. So I I'm sure that if you put uh, uh, something together, it may happen. And uh, because ultimately we are talking of uh, multiple sustainable goals over here. So this is this is about one of the sustainable solutions of waste to well. And. if there are any questions about this then i before that uh, then i can move on to another example of this one good evening sir this is kalyan this yeah. side yeah uh, sir just out of curiosity i just wanted to know like i've just seen that you know some component as you said like 20 to 30% or 40% of plastic mixed plastic is added as an ingredient to prepare the bricks yeah so can i know how well can you justify that this use of plastic will not affect the you know, ecological cycle or environment or is it is not harmful to human nature how is that you justify so uh, to answer that question i have a question if i may uh, how how is it verified so see again i am not an expert on plastic and uh, is this is one of the reasons why i am discussing this is could somebody help us understand uh, where whether the plastic be dumped into uh, uh, landfill is better this is a little better or not having plastic at, at all is better and what could be the impact of uh, this bricks and how to test it what are the tests required so i am not aware of those tests as of today and so that is our next process as i said uh, uh explain that we need to do a lot of tests on this but uh, as on today what i am trying to do is uh, uh choose a lesser evil i i know plastic is an evil as on today if you are using it in any material 
but this is a much lesser evil than putting in a landfill i hope you <coughs> would agree to that can we agree that this is a yes, lesser evil yes, when you put it to a bin yeah okay. exactly and, and it is also consuming another evil which is dust which you are not aware of because if this dust is flying in there it is going to get into your nostrils and it is silica carbon and clay so today it's a challenge for the industry where to dump this dust so there are two two problems which you are solving with this addressing with this i would not say solve they are addressing and reducing reducing the level which was higher to maybe a lower level i don't know if this is a perfect solution but it is definitely better than what we have put so i hope you are able to satisfy your thing yes sir yeah thank you manish uh, yeah beyond residential houses uh. i hope this brick can be used in like pavements and uh, you know sure. pavements in the on the bridges or parks and all what i'm just saying is the concern uh, kalyan ji also raised basically you know health risk may be more accentuated if it is on the residential uh, wall blocks but if it is in an open space like park or uh, pavement and all and this interlocking thing i find very much in the park and you know outside uh concrete flooring kind of a thing you know so there uh, that risk could also be minimized or we can use use it in other building blocks like in the flyovers or things like that so i think the health risk if at all are there can be managed that way also it's a great innovation and can have many different use i was thinking i will give you so when you are talking of solutions so pravat ji when you give you an idea of a solution is uh, we know that we are looking at a swachh swachh bharat abhiyan on toilet blocks yeah correct uh, what if we make a pre engineered uh, assembled Excellent. toilet block on toilet right? so this is this is where we are now working with, with architects and civil engineers you have said this is the material available so now you tell us what to do yeah, yeah. okay okay, okay. and we are open to work with any work with anybody who is uh, willing to take this project from the academics from uh, 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 social social ecosystem because uh, again we have to remember one thing very well uh, from my perspective camera open to come then Yes. Uh, that video is the party somebody manish i think you can mute i can i am not focused the convener can please please hang is actually host for this uh, pratya is the host i muted them yeah. so thank you so uh we have to keep uh, see we should not lose sight of our goals In, in ways to well uh it should be a sustainable solution it should not get if, if it the moment it transgresses into becoming a commercial solution then we'll start having problems is my feel uh when we are trying to make uh income uh, uh i think there is a problem in the connection so i will just join back yeah i was not listening him yeah sorry i we lost i dropped my <laughs> video assuming mine is bad <laughs> okay 
so let me find where is my presentation first. Now I have some uh, net issue at home, and uh, the Wi-Fi is gone, so I'm working on the Wi-Fi. No problem. Sir. So, uh, as I said, uh, if if you are looking at this from a, if you are able to think very clearly as a social project, uh, not being my primary source of income, and let the project be self-sustained, I am sure this could become a much needed solution which we can look at. So, Do this is one. Yeah, please. Do we get any environment credit or carbon credit or something equivalent? I, I do not know those jargons exact meaning, but some credit that can make it more commercially viable also some encouragement that government gives or our policy can give because it is doing a good purpose to the eco the environment, right? right. So I'll, I'll only uh, humbly put it this way that uh, when you Start an innovation, uh, and if we look at what I will get as an outcome, and probably you will you will be very much aware of this philosophy that that outcome is not driving the input; it's the input which is delivering yes, the outcome. Yes, yes. Absolutely, yes. yes. Yeah. So, so once you have reached a certain so in innovation, if you detach yourself from subsidy, if you detach yourself from uh, discounts. You discount some, something. Dis, dis, disconnect yourself and first try to see whether the project can stand on its own feet. That deals your project. The yeah. moment we start looking at any project, okay, I'll get a subsidy from here. I'll get. Uh, so why we are working on making this uh, a standalone without CSR? Can we? So this is something which we are continuously focusing. Otherwise, uh, uh, one one of the easy ways, okay, CSR money will come with the, the pre cost 10 rupees or 15 rupees, somebody will buy, buy, and then it will go into a pile and it will get shelved as a project. So most of the innovations die away when we are not looking at sustainability aspect of the business. And, and that's where entrepreneurial thinking uh, comes into play where we we remove all those uh, possible risks from any project and if you are able to make the project self sustained then i can also uh, uh, be able to balance the risk which may come in when there is a value added to the plastic or there is a value for the input material then i have got a cushion to uh, uh, absorb that risk right so that's why I'm, I'm, I'm sure there will be carbon credits, there will be environment credits. There can be so many things which can happen. But these are all... Sir, uh, would, yeah, please. Uh, sir, like uh, government is helping you out in this, like any, uh, through any of the way? Or like they, they are uh, bringing, like you have to bring this upon, so government is there for you or not right now? Uh, once again, I'm repeating that we you know we have not taken any government support uh, of course so, but using uh, the plastic you it. can you can use that thing as well right see uh, the government has its intentions in the right place is what i can say but uh, when you are in developing an innovation uh, you cannot get the government inside in when you are doing development you would go because to the government has... and yeah, in please. Singapore, uh, I think there is uh, one way to dispose of all the plastic. They have one machinery. I don't remember the name exactly, but uh, they have uh, that machinery and uh, that disposes of the plastic waste uh, just in 12 hours, I think so. So, and no fumes are released, nothing is there. Clean air is there. Right, right. Uh, so, again, Abhishek, uh, <clears throat> plastic is something known to everybody, right? But my problem is not plastic. My problem is here, sand and fine dust. Okay, sir. Okay. So uh, again, the focus is here, whereas most of the people with whom I have discussed, their focus is here on the plastic, and my focus is on my industry.
because i understand this problem is not known to a lot of people uh, but so you are using the plastic only the waste only in making yeah i am using plastic waste but that is one of the components which is 20% of the component right uh, what you are saying is absolutely okay, correct uh, that the, there is a so government has a mandate we have discussed with the government people also and they said that uh, once you are okay, ready sir, with a solution it would help it would be helpful for you also like if you take the government support uh, government will be helping you in this because uh, if you will be finding any way to use the plastic that will be helpful for you as well if the go government comes up on so uh let me uh, so there are a lot of complexities when you work with a larger ecosystem uh so are you working in a corporate or a, a small organization if i can ask what is the size of organization which you, which you are connected with i can so give you that currently, currently i am a stu post graduate student okay so so as a post graduate student you are part of a university right now if you were to try to uh, get an innovation and try to get a decision from the vice chancellor there is a lot of process which has to happen and to be and there'll be 10 people or 100 people who would like to get that done how does a vice chancellor filter out that abhishek has the right solution it's not very easy for the person sitting at the top to filter it out which means i need to have a proof of concept yes sir uh, and without a proof of concept going to the government will not work so it's a it's a cycle and somebody has to start the cycle uh, the government has already started the cycle and shown the intent it is for the community to also take in equal responsibility today for us to get plastic uh, you know the source of plastic for us is our two uh institutional institutions one is a hospital who has a waste collection system other than the bio uh, hazardous one so all the plastic bottles and packet chip packets or whatever comes who the people who are visiting the hospital so they have a system to collect that waste and every month uh, week we get around 150 200 kg of plastic from them it's about a kilometer to 2 kilometers from our factory there is a large industry who uses packaging materials uh, for their uh, so we are getting plastic directly from the source now normally this would go to the municipal corporation and then i would have to go to the municipal corporation we are again talking of resource efficiency taking anything from the source is much better than taking from the second person yes sir right so that is the way we are approach the subject and now we are going to the government and now when i am saying okay this is a proposal uh, it comes into your solid waste management mandate this is how it is working we have had the visit of a nagar palika head at our factory and she has said manish bhai whenever you are ready with the solution uh, let us come and discuss and sign it they are open to that it's not that they are not able or are open to that but without a proof of concept going to any a government body and saying okay we want to do this it is going to take a lot of time and ultimately you will get frustrated but we have to sit on the other side also we have to empathize with the government also that their hands are full i i hope i am able to give a different perspective yes sir so uh similar to this i'll explain a, another project which is uh, not very uh, new but uh, let me give a brief uh, understanding of something else which we did and and this understanding of working with the social ecosystem uh, has uh, the base from uh, this project okay yeah? this is another a waste to wealth project which uh, uh, we have another company vimansa which is into women's ethnic wear garment manufacturing now this is uh, my sister priyanka uh, she started this business and we i joined hands with her in 2015 and there was a vision she had was 
i don't want any of my waste to go into landfill because whenever you are making a garment and stitching uh, so when you are cutting the garment you have got side cuts you have got some waste generated excess cloth generated and uh, normally it would go into landfill so and or use for cleaning and again there is a resource and the efficiency is not fully realized so it is not so harmful but uh, we are talking of resource efficiency so this is a project which you uh, see graphically what we have done is whatever waste is coming so we have all this is going on for last more than 2 years partnered with ngos particularly i partner at handheld i uh who connected us who are a larger level uh, ngos who are connected to csr so they already have uh, arrangement with csrs uh, which help them set up the units or the centers in rural uh, or industrial belts where uh they are supporting the local community so there can be a foundation self help group or not for profit society uh the cloth goes to this foundation who gives it to this the women uh, most of them are women uh, uh at uh, village level so uh, where we provide them uh, training uh, understanding of quality systems and uh, we the access to technology and access to market lies with mimansa whereas the funds and infrastructure is provided by the ngo and the csr support so this entire setup has got impacts uh, on employment which is livelihood uh, waste so this is a wasted talent i would say wasted resource uh, human capabilities there our women are not not part of our uh, gdp who are in the rural setting because they don't have any access to markets or so they know to make simple things uh, but they are not having access to uh, continuous market demand so they are unemployed under privilege and the money is going to them directly from here the money goes directly here and they are supported uh, the center is supported by them and this is a replicable model and this is one of the models which we have done with uh, head and high uh and uh very systematic so there's a goal what we want to do is is also a, a micro entrepreneurship model and as you progress i can show you how it works so first is the entire process of uh identifying screening uh, mapping their aspirations general training all this is done by uh headled high Uh, or the ngos with whom we are connected uh, when you talk of specific skill uh, that's where mimansa starts uh, providing the tech lit tech pack and how to do it we incubate this group through uh, hand holding and giving some initial production there's an investment from all of us and start documenting the economic outcome so you can see from zero to getting anything out and uh, on the board is around 365 days so women entering here would exit here now this is a very unique program where we don't talk of people being permanently as part of the center like any business should have an entry strategy there should be an exit strategy also uh, so this is this is for, uh, for the model for rural community uh, engineering sustainable like you know. once again the activities stakeholders there is a setup there is a fabric sourcing there is training there is operation and there is a product to market so every person in this ecosystem will have a role to play as a model and the key material raw materials the entire project is divided into three uh, stakeholder segments each one has their own responsibility uh, very clearly identified and demands as main responsibility comes on the market uh, the center is given training for quality control production and uh, where mimansa again has its role uh, of monetary 
And these are some of the products. Uh, so we started with bags, simple bags. This also needed a quality control because if you don't manage the consistent quality size, uh, and you are talking of supplying 5,000 bags, 10,000 bags, or uh, 50,000 bags, the consistency is very important. And as we go in the supply chain from bags, now we are making masks with them, uh, we are looking at moving to a uh, value added product which can get so that in the livelihood chain they would keep on growing and probably at a certain level uh, they would become independent as micro business owners and this is a model where we have a lot of resources which i would not call waste but they are underutilized resources underutilized resources in our country where this model is now we are building the uh, matrix of how to do this do this on, on a, a long term basis and and because of covid drought uh, now when people are moving back to villages this model has become even more important how to move business from uh, metros to rural settings and since we already have the model in place we are now scaling this up slowly and taking it to different places uh, across the country. This is again, I'm not going to detail, but this is uh, something which is existing for a very long time in our country. But if you see biogas has still not become popular. Yesterday, I was part of a discussion. How can this become self sustained? So this is another waste uh, in the rural segment, also in the city segment to make uh, uh, waste into wealth. This is a project which we can discuss at some other time when the expert of this, Kadia uh, Saran Viral Patel, I think is part of the discussion, can share this story with you. So, to bring back the focus on innovative solutions, uh, I, what, why I'm coming to this subject is huh? whenever you're talking, yeah, please. Sir, Any questions? Is, sir, this is question, sir. Good evening. Yeah. Sir, I had a doubt. Like uh, you told that it takes uh, uh, one year, like three sixty-five days, for an unemployed woman to you know just uh, uh, learn the entire thing. Uh, if I'm not wrong, uh, as far as I could understand, and then after three sixty-five days, uh, she could yes, sir. So after three sixty-five days, she could uh, turn herself into an independent woman. So. Uh, after one year, what are the opportunities available to her, sir? Like, like uh, can she sustain on her own or can she start a similar thing uh, uh, which she has learned over the period of time? So my doubt was regarding that, sir. Uh, a very, very good question. And I thank you for asking this. Probably I missed to explain this. So again, we have to understand this entire business is built on a concept of value chain. Uh, I hope you understand value chain. So yes, value sir, chain yes. is right. So there's a, a supplier tier one, tier two, tier three, and we have a value chain. Uh, if you look today in our industry, this value chain is very uh, uh, fragmented. It's not stitched together. Here we are talking of a value chain which is stitched from year to year. Okay, one, two, three, four players. Uh, this is tier one. This is the top of the value chain who is selling the product over here. So today we are in the business of making masks. Uh, at this moment, we have started some special masks with IIT Bombay and we are selling that. Now in that value chain, I am uh, selling a, from uh, it's a B2C model where we are putting this on. We are selling this product. So Nimansa is partnered HHH. HHH has uh, set up a foundation or a center with the help of a CSR and we have this group over here. Now out of this, when mask is a simple product, as you go up in the value chain in your quality and your productivity, probably you can go from a 3 rupees per mask to a 60 rupees per dress. So you are uh, going up the skill ladder also. And as you go up the skill ladder, you also go up the value ladder. But this connection is not lost. This connection still remains. 
the reason why Nimansa is interested to work in this project is Nimansa wants to build uh, manufacturing centers in rural segment. So it's in the interest of Nimansa to handhold the, the people working in the center and be part of the value chain. So the market assurance still comes from Nimansa. All which has happened is instead of this connection, the connection may go like this directly. Okay, that's the only change which will happen. But the connection may still be here, and they can also work with other players like Dimansa. So they they have now the experience, they have the skill, they have the training. So in one year, they are able to work independently, and maybe they can have another five six women working with them as a group, and produce and be be, be part of the value chain. So, so it's all about stitching the value chains and stitching, stitching long-term contracts. Okay, sir. Got it. Got it. Uh, sir, yeah. I have a yeah. doubt. Uh, sir, actually in the, this 365 days uh, program, so initially they'll be earning something or not? Because uh, if you are... So uh, going... Right, right. So their earning will start from here. Somewhere after so, one month. Oh, okay, sir. So, sir, so actually the thing is like... Training is done, uh, once your practical training is done, you are in the internship mode. Okay, so you start stitching masks. So, so for example, a woman with a uh, level zero of skill, maybe stitching twenty masks in a day. So she'll earn sixty rupees a day to start with. So she is learning and earning in the same time. Uh, the a skilled person may be able to stitch 100 masks in the same time. So from 30 masks to 100 masks is a journey which may happen in one month, 15 days or two months. It, it is depending on the person. But their earning will be there. Okay, sir. Uh, but sir, actually in the rural areas, like to tap up person to come up and work upon this thing. So initially for 15, 20 days, they will not be getting anything. So how do you think like they will be coming at for it or not so so that's where headed high uh, is an important uh, part so the uh, as i said the partnership with an ngo which has already got its uh, uh, so if nimansa was working directly it would not happen i i don't think nimansa would be able to work directly with entrepreneur center or with sgs directly because there it requires a handholding. So the CSR fund, which is coming to, so if you see, there's a CSR partner here, right? This yes, is infrastructure sir. and capex. There's also pre-operative expense, which is outlay, which is there. Okay, sir. So that pre-operative, uh, so let us say, uh, I'm talking about center in Wadi, uh, in uh, uh, Karnataka. Okay. At this moment, they have no source of income. They are at zero income. Head and High has set up a center over there and say, if you come here, we'll give you training and in next 30 days, we'll start earning money. Then why would somebody not come? There, there, it will come because of the trust. Uh, so that's another subject about uh, NGOs. Uh, when I when I'm mentoring NGOs, the the most important part of a social enterprise is to build trust in the community. And building trust in the community itself takes two to three years minimum. So yes. headed high coming with a background of let us say a decade of experience and engagement. So they have a background of being delivering on the. And because they are dealing on the ground, there's a trust in the community that, okay, this company, if they are saying something, it will happen. Correct? Trust is the center. Yes. center. So actually, they trust a I... single person who is there in the, yes. with uh, yes. them. Because actually, yes. I last I worked with the KPMG, so there, I was there in the audit part. So I was there on uh, audit of a microfinance company. So okay. there I know about like, if a single person is visiting a village, so all the people will trust that person only. Right. So trust is at the center of everything. Right? Everything. So you have trusted two hours of time. You don't know me, but you know MWP, isn't it? So that is a trust. Why you are why you are conversing over here. 
transaction because of certain deliverables which have happened in the past so uh, uh, trust has a very important role in everything even mimansa and hedeld high have a relationship because i have been mentoring i have been part of that mentoring team and then mimansa has come in later on it's not that mimansa came first and then i uh, became a mentor it was the other way around so we had that trust between each other and then we had a partnership and then the entrepreneur center uh, started all those centers started uh, coming up so that trust factor is important and uh, in value chain building that trust can come from experience and uh, at the end i I'll, i'll give you another uh, uh, summarize how this trust happens in another ecosystem which is the last and third part of uh, what i want to share so if you permit then i may go ahead with the yes sir sir so this is this is something uh, now when we went into this block or waste to wealth innovations or all the other innovations this is some of the areas where since you are self motivated uh, and we had a very clear goal in our mind we could break this but but today in the community uh, the society says why are you innovating do your job why you want to leave a job i think many of us so for example you have said that you are part of kpmg and tomorrow if you say that your family that i am going to leave kpmg and i am going to start a social enterprise there is going to be huge resistance in the society there will be a social resistance to change uh, so people working in academics uh, thinking of entrepreneurship uh, as a, uh, or innovation as a career was nowadays it is very common but if you talk of 10 day years before or 20 years before it was not so common at that time people were risk averse right uh, risk averse but today we are ready to take the risk okay but is the industry supporting the innovation i still have question marks how many industries really support innovations at the grassroots level uh, how much innovation how much is the support so there is we need to encourage innovation for that we have to break these four areas and so that is the reason the uh, government of india is coming up with various programs of that yeah yeah so that's what i'm saying there has been a change there is a, i can see that change but uh, and that's why we are discussing this but this is this is still a long way to go uh, we see something happening at the top but at the ground level the bottom level we are still looking at marks we are still looking at numbers we are still now we have got a new education policy which is possibly going to change many of these things correct but there is another reality which uh, i'll try to show you uh, i will not use this so this is how the innovation is in our country today so somebody just mentioned i am from the uh, education background doing post graduation how much is your connection with the industry when you are looking at innovation sir actually i was the one who said this and earlier i worked in kpmg and after that i joined post graduation right now okay you only said no so you have coming from an industry and getting into academia but uh, i uh, i am talking generally i am not saying that there may be few people who are able to uh, but generally the old scenario was very scattered uh, failure is a taboo the government issue policies and uh, were different the industry is not ready to change uh, industry does not have research capabilities so we are all in four different silos today waste to wealth program is to bring these silos together so when you are talking of uh, reducing the cost of processing then i need a theoretical support from the academics unfortunately i am sitting today in the center of an education hub okay but i uh, even for last two years i don't have any support from the academic skill now it's a reality there's there's nothing uh, because they have their own constraints i don't say they don't want to do but everybody has been tied up in certain constraints and we are not able to uh, 
uh, untangle us. Industry has this constraint of being commercially viable. The academics has this constraint of curriculum and timing. Uh, the government has so many things to do. There's so much to do. Uh, it cannot go into small issues. Uh, so its allocation of funds can be uh, not focus on only one company or one sector. It has to be very transparent. And the society has not seen successful models. So it has a lot of questions. Today, there is a lot of change. I can definitely tell you there's a lot of change. But there's something else which I'm associated with. And uh, uh, Prabodh Ji is, uh, they, realize, they relate to this, is could we bring all those four elements together to talk of a common and the innovators at the center of the entire ecosystem? So this is where we, I came across a program uh, by the name of Empretec, which is a UN program uh, talking about sustainable development. This program has a mention in the UN General Assembly as one of the programs which can uh, help in sustainable, uh, has been recommended for, not help, only help, recommended for sustainable development in the world, globally. A program which has been come has come to India by invitation of Ministry of MSME about six seven years back. Uh, before that, almost for a decade, there has been a lot of work being done, and it works on the culture of entrepreneurship. The entire uh, story, which I uh, or uh, not story, the, the examples which I am talking to you, is full of entrepreneurial thinking, uh, setting goals, getting the information, having a plan. Uh, understanding risk, difference between risk and uncertainty, taking opportunities, uh, uh, having a very good quality systems uh, and ensuring that you have systems in place. Uh, a lot of passion and commitment required. That's where the social, social entrepreneurship becomes important. And having the courage to speak and talk to people, having the self-confidence, having the ability to network. All these are part of a cultural uh, understanding of behaviors uh, uh, which are fundamental to entrepreneurship and uh, we have found from my experience that we have been able to use this framework and bring all this and trying to bring all these elements together in this pandemic times to remain competitive to be resilient and still uh, do innovation do you do you think in today's time is it possible for somebody to talk of r d and investing r d is someone else say, are you, uh, are you crazy of talking of R&D when there is no money? But when, when you have a very strong understanding of your goals and your plans, then the situations may come and go, but you, you will continue to tread your path. Uh, you'll keep on adjusting your uh, systems and uh, see that your solutions, which are uh, you're uh, looking at are sustainable. And so we can say that pharma industry is uh, using that, like they are into R&D, even if there is this situation as well. So, of course, uh, pharma is in R&D, but pharma is in R&D because it's also necessary for them to do R&D. It's not only because of uh, passion. It's not only because of, uh, because they know if they don't do R&D, they are out of the market. There is no, right? So pharma industry without R&D will not work. It's a necessity. But talk of a foundry industry and tell me how many foundry industries have uh, yeah, please. Please go ahead. Hello? Yeah, yeah sir. sorry, sir. My mic was not. Uh, sir, uh, uh, you have just spoke about that uh, combining everything and do, uh, do innovation. Sir, uh, what I uh, uh, read a few days uh, before, like uh, uh, for a CSR activity or uh, for any R and D, the uh, industries are doing as a part of CSR uh, just to show the government that uh, they are able to do the CSR, uh, so that government will allow the industry to do the business in that. Area. So if uh, government or the industry are not allowing to, uh, they are not doing as a part of uh, their own interest. Then how can we think about that innovation? I mean, they are just doing uh, so that they have to do the business. That's why they are doing. So, uh, how can we uh, think about this uh, innovation? From industry level only, we are just doing for our own benefit. So, are you not talking about this slide? 
this yes, is what you are talking uh, about right yes sir yes, but yes, i am from the industry uh, and i am from an sme industry i am not from a so for me csr is not mandatory it's part of uh, my mission i mean uh, yes it is but again, uh, if i again think about the government policies and all then again we'll get stuck there right? so so i think uh, there is one very important question which is coming up and we need to address this very well the government job is to enable us to do something is allow us to do something the government's job is not to fund us because who's going to pay the government is so we are going to pay the power the government is not growing money we as entrepreneurs are generating money so if we are conscious enough if we are able to understand how to make a sustainable innovation why do you need government money what you need is a government mandate or a support so i don't think this but, this sir, is the key but uh, sir to do the business or to set up our business we need government right sir okay so why do you need the government so can i give can an example see? like let us talk of an example uh sir the like elon musk is there so if he is into the sustainable uh, things so i think government is also somewhat helping him regarding that so so we are now looking at an outcome bias as we call it. okay so do you know the entire journey of elon musk did he get support from the government from the day one he started to think to be an innovator no sir from not from the day one but yeah uh, with the time he get the support so what did he do in those so if you draw a journey of elon musk uh, if you have studied uh, i have not read about him but i can assume that his initial period of 2 years or 5 years he would not have worked with government support so actually initially he started with the spacex and then after that he grown up various industries and like uh, right now is into tesla so tesla is one of the no, growing industries let us industry. let us stick to let us stick to government at this moment you are talking about government so tell me after how many years did he get government support sir actually after he becoming the one of the ceos of he became the in charge of tesla yeah. the company was so, bankrupt so let, actually so then explain to me, no, no, no. so explain to me what happened before the government support was there so there sir, was, uh, can i tell you the proof of concept yeah please sir so uh, when uh, spacex when like elon musk was a part of spacex he he is still part of spacex so he he had you know many he was sourcing many projects uh, on his own and he wasn't constant constant talks with nasa but nasa was not supporting him supporting him for right. the project and then sir uh, when he uh, as you rightly said sir we need to uh, give a value we need to prove our concept first so he started you know uh, commercializing the space uh, industry and then he he showed them the innovation and when he showed them that uh, sir because uh, earlier uh, nasa uh, uh, had very um, uh, many failed missions uh, in which they were launching uh, uh, shuttles and uh, they were they were like busting in the in the space in the open space so uh, a spacex came came up with a with a with a very uh, innovative solution and then they tied up with nasa and when nasa was uh, completely sure about uh, that whether or not it's completely safe for an astronaut to travel in that then uh, nasa funded spacex so you are right in saying that sir government first saw the proof and then they supported spacex so so i think you have answered part most of the uh, question which you have given the answer yourself so whenever and this is where uh, this is where i would tell you uh, the philosophy of entrepreneurial culture is so important that why are we looking at something which is beyond my control which is going to help me control my system uh, so 
i should look into my locus of control my area of influence rather than looking at an area which is beyond my control okay so uh, what i am if i am as sitting at the center as an innovator my the innovator also may be uh, if he is able to start uh, getting the entrepreneurial culture inside because innovation requires a lot of passion that that is i think we all would agree that it comes from the heart right innovation does not come from the mind uh, principally it comes starts from the heart and then the mind enters the space now it's a balance between the managing your heart and mind so my heart says i am doing excellent but i have not done a back of the envelope calculation that my innovation may not work all i have been explaining for the last couple, one and a half hours is uh, i could say that the government is not helping me this is a government's project i have i have not even uttered a statement like this i am saying i am a partner to the government as an industry uh what i am now looking at is connecting academia society and the government together so i have to start from somewhere somebody has to start the government has taken an initiative but government cannot come and look at each and every innovation this is one aspect we should we, if we are able to understand then probably our country would definitely be able to do a lot so what if it is not done uh this is where uh, it's about incubating innovation so the concern today you are looking at government for helping you so it is the industry also can help and it is such kind of forum so if you ask me as an sme uh, i i am one of the industries we could say okay i am ready to Uh, I think he lost his connection. I think he's left. Yeah, I, I mean he lost his connection. I think. John Bank. But but uh, to to come back to the question of innovation support system, uh, I think in our country we have a lot of MSMEs. who would be ready to support innovations as long as they are part of their value chain and uh, if you are able to look at an ecosystem uh, for me empretic is one of them what you are doing is one of them and ecosystems come together to a common purpose of how can we foster innovations how can we nurture innovations then it's a combination of cultural uh, understanding the entrepreneurship culture uh an innovation innovator may not have the wherewithal they may not have the uh, financial capacity they might not be able to set up a factory but if somebody asks me can you give me a 1000 square feet or 2000 square feet space i want to do some experiment and uh, you make an mou with me or uh, you start working with me and you use some common facilities you can start looking at those uh, possibilities you have to start thinking out of the box we should not be looking at only a fixed mind area that incubation centers are only in academic institutions or in government bodies uh, i live in anand there are 800 manufacturing industries in this industrial area and i can tell you 10 of them would come if you say that i am going to improve this process and this is going to help you we can start to discuss with them i would look at uh, different options uh, 
if there are any more questions uh, i would be happy to take them no sir no questions no questions so uh, this is this is what i wanted to share with you and thank you so much for listening i don't know how clear i was uh, and uh, that's why i have requested prachi to have a recording of this done yeah and, uh, not a problem and uh, you can share this recording with whoever wants it i i have no intellectual property issue with me thank you thank you sir uh, it was such an information session the work which you are carrying forward for the upliftment of women and for the good health of the nature is really appreciated sir we the member of mwb are really thankful to have such a fruitful session with you and wish you all the luck for your future ventures i also want to extend my thank and gratitude to other esteemed guests who have joined and raised their queries and made this session more interactive thank you very much for having this session sir thank you so much so stay safe stay healthy and uh, maybe we'll connect again any other time uh, my numbers and everything is on linkedin my most of the posts are on public domain uh, everything is there in the open what i have so uh, do we have prabod saha sir or he left prabod sir uh, i think he left just for the information for the team he is a director for cloud infra development in service now you also work with many companies like the de shaw group and bw in party digital entertainment he was a co-founder and vice president of nice fit career consulting private limited he also gave a lot of workshops uh, one of such workshop is in i am bangalore for management why you jump here why you jump here okay Uh, so thank you for bringing such esteemed guests also to have with us sir thank sure. you sure sure most welcome thank you everybody thank you very much for having you thank you very much thank you. it has been it has been insightful thank you from nigeria <laughs> thank you look forward to working in nigeria i have been yes. to nigeria uh, i have oh, been wow. to africa nigeria algeria uh, wow that's impressive and that tanzania Sure. Wow, it's good to and have I you. Think, thank you very much. And I much. think I think Africa is the next uh, growth uh, continent of the world. Yes, Africa is is the growth place of the future. Yes, we yeah. hope we hope so too. Yes, thank you very much. Well, what are you calling? Have a lovely day. Bye. Thank Bye. you. Bye. 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 Uh. Thank you so we will end the recording session for now. Okay. Thank you. Thank you guys. Thank you.